Welcome back to the Stroke Made Simple channel and today we're going to be talking about hemorrhagic stroke. So a couple things about hemorrhagic stroke before we start. We covered in prior um, lectures that ischemic stroke, i.e. stroke caused by an occluded blood vessel that supplies the brain or is located in the brain, is the vast majority or 87% of all of stroke. Whereas hemorrhagic stroke, what we're going to be talking about today, is the vast minority or about 13% of all stroke. However, if you're working at a stroke center, you're going to run into hemorrhagic stroke and you're going to have to talk to patients about hemorrhagic stroke and what caused it. So having a good uh, basis of knowledge on this is not a bad thing. Before we start, if you find the content of these videos to be informative, please hit the like and subscribe button so we could make sure more and more people are made aware of these videos. So we have multiple objectives today. Really, um, I was going to list them, but I like this diagram so much. And you see this diagram at the end of this lecture too, when we summarize everything. Today, we're going to be focusing on hemorrhagic stroke. Okay, so we want to know what is the cause of hemorrhagic stroke. We want to know that hemorrhagic stroke is divided into bleeding within the brain, which is called intracerebral hemorrhagic stroke, and bleeding covering the brain. This is subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, both intracerebral bleeding within the brain and subarachnoid hemorrhage bleeding surrounding the brain can be located superficially or deep within the brain tissues, okay? And we're going to talk about these distinctions. So for intracerebral bleed, when it's located superficially, we're concerned about things like cerebral amyloid angiopathy. When this intracerebral bleeding occurs within deep brain tissues, we're more concerned of hypertensive hemorrhage. Now, we're going to review this completely in the lecture, so don't be too concerned about this right now. For subarachnoid hemorrhage or bleeding covering the brain, there is a deep or central location, and things that can do that are aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, perimesencephalic venous subarachnoid hemorrhage, and subarachnoid hemorrhage can also occur superficially. And things we are concerned about for that include venous infarct, vasculitis, and mycotic aneurysms. So again, there's a lot of information, but don't worry, it's all in the book, so you don't have to take any notes, just read chapter six in the book. So again, to recap, stroke is divided into ischemic stroke, which accounts for the vast majority of all of stroke, 87%, again, this is from an occluded blood vessel, or hemorrhagic stroke, which is the vast minority of all of stroke, and this is caused by a leaking blood vessel in the brain. So we talked about this in the last lecture. We talked about the different mechanisms or causes of acute ischemic stroke. And if we look at these subtypes, they're divided into large vessel, atherosclerotic disease, about 30%, embolic strokes of undetermined etiology, ESIS, 30%. Remember, that's the newer term for cryptogenic stroke, which is presumably thromboembolic. We talked about cardioembolic stroke, which is about 20%, small vessel disease, which includes lacunar infarcts, which is about 15%. And we talked about other stroke causes and conditions, such as dissection and uh, infectious endocarditis. Remember, aortic dissection and endocarditis are both contraindications for IVTPA. Again, this is all in the book. We also talked about a mnemonic that allows us to remember the different etiologies for acute ischemic stroke. The mnemonic is CAUSE. The C stands for cardioembolic. A is atherosclerotic large vessel disease. U is undetermined etiology. S is small vessel disease. And E is everything else. So hemorrhagic stroke, remember we talked about uh, this earlier, caused by bleeding within the brain or on the surface of the brain can be separated or classified into intracerebral hemorrhage, which is 10% of all stroke, and subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is about 3% of all stroke, okay? So again, when we look at ischemic stroke, it's the vast majority of all stroke. It has these subtypes that we went over. Hemorrhagic stroke accounts for only 13%. And those components you could see here, bleeding within the brain, intracerebral hemorrhage is 10% of all stroke, Subarachnoid hemorrhage, hemorrhagic stroke on the surface of the brain is 3% of all of stroke. Now, one thing we just have to um, clarify very quickly is both uh, intracerebral hemorrhage and subarachnoid hemorrhage are forms of intracranial hemorrhage, meaning hemorrhage within the skull. 
However, intracranial hemorrhage, hemorrhage within the skull, is not the same as intracerebral hemorrhage, okay? So bleeding, and we'll get into these different types of bleeds later, surrounding the brain are not the same as inside the brain. So when we talk about bleeding within the brain, this is intracerebral hemorrhage. A lot of people conflate that term with intracranial hemorrhage. It's a different term, okay? Again, intracerebral uh, hemorrhage is bleeding within the brain parenchyma. Now, there are many causes of non-traumatic intracranial hemorrhage. By the way, I'm going to do a traumatic uh, brain lecture in the future, but today we're talking about non-traumatic entities. So when we talk about non-traumatic intracranial hemorrhage, uh, most of these types of hemorrhage are either related to hypertensive hemorrhage or cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Okay, now there's a list of different entities that could cause these different uh, uh, types of bleeds within the brain, but the two we want to focus on, which accounts for the ma vast majority of cases, is hypertensive hemorrhage and cerebral amyloid angiopathy. So both hypertensive hemorrhage and cerebral amyloid angiopathy can, in addition to causing major bleeds in the brain, can cause small perivascular hemosiderin deposits. Hemosiderin is a component, it's the iron component of your blood. And these small deposits are called cerebral microbleeds. Okay, they appear as dark lesions and MRI hemosiderin sensitive imaging sequences. I'll show you them in a minute, it'll make more sense. So both hypertensive hemorrhage and cerebral amyloid angiopathy are characterized by both these small cerebral microbleeds and gross parenchymal hemorrhage. And we'll show that in a minute, okay? The key though to distinguish these two is hypertensive hemorrhage typically occurs in deeper regions of the brain, whereas cerebral amyloid angiopathy, uh, their cerebral microbleeds or parenchymal hemorrhage tend to occur in more superficial lobar locations. So again, hypertensive hemorrhage, the cerebral microbleeds and gross bleeds that accompany them tend to occur in deeper areas of the brain, where cerebral amyloid angiopathy, the cerebral microbleeds and parenchymal hemorrhage that are associated with them tend to occur in more superficial lobar locations. We call these superficial bleeds lobar bleeds. So here's a picture and MRI depicting this. You could see that these little black dots, this is an MRI susceptibility image that shows these little black dots in the periphery of the brain. See this? These are located peripherally, not centrally. When we see this peripheral location, the superficial location, we think of cerebral amyloid angiopathy, okay? In this situation, in this MRI uh, susceptibility sequence for iron, we see that these microbleeds are located in a more deep or central location, and these are caused by hypertensive uh, arteriopathy versus cerebral amyloid angiopathy, which is a more superficial location. So another thing is hypertensive hemorrhage is an acquired disease related to long-standing hypertension affecting the brain's deeper, smaller penetrating arteries. Whereas cerebral amyloid angiopathy is characterized by amyloid deposition within the superficially located meningeal and cortical blood vessels. That's why this has superficial uh, presentation and this is why hypertensive hemorrhage has a more deeper penetration. Remember, hypertensive hemorrhage is the deeper small penetrating arteries of the brain where cerebral amyloid angiopathy involves more superficially located meningeal and cortical blood vessels. So again, in this image here, we look at these cerebral microbleeds. These are located more superficially in cerebral amyloid angiopathy. And for hypertensive hemorrhage, these cerebral microbleeds are located in a deeper location, these small penetrating arteries here in the lateral lenticular striate arteries. This is the M1 segment. Here's the superior division. Here's the inferior division in this diagram. But again, deep penetrating arteries for hypertensive uh, cerebral microbleeds. And here's what's going on. When we look at these small penetrating arteries, you could see that these over time become diseased with um, long-standing hypertension. They could rupture and cause these bleeds. And again, they don't necessarily have to have a large rupture. They could have those small cerebral microbleeds also. But again, 
the the hallmark for hypertensive hemorrhage is a more deep location okay whereas cerebral amyloid angiopathy is a more superficial location okay hypertensive hemorrhages can also occur in the pons and the cerebellum so lobar hemorrhage or this superficial location hemorrhage is most commonly caused by cerebral amyloid angiopathy a degenerative vascular disorder and how does that happen well cerebral amyloid angiopathy weakens vascular integrity okay it causes the vessels to leak and bleed because cerebral amyloid angiopathy is a chronic degenerative disease it is more prevalent in the elderly so if you see a low bar superficial bleed in an elderly patient it is likely cerebral amyloid angiopathy so here we have a, a wall a circular wall made of bricks you can imagine if i started removing some of these bricks this wall would get weaker this is an immunofluorescent stain looking at blood vessels in the brain affected by cerebral amyloid angiopathy and you could see that this plaque which is the same plaque as alzheimer's disease it's not the same disease we'll talk about in one second integrates itself within the vessel walls of blood vessels in the brain now remember these vessels have a more superficial location they're meningeal or cortical blood vessels in the brain this is another immunofluorescent stain showing this area of plaque sandwiched between the um the wall of a blood vessel in the brain this causes these vessels to become weakened leak and to a small extent could cause cerebral microbleeds but to a larger extent cause lower hemorrhages and again these are in a superficial location because the meningeal and cortical vessels they affect are superficially located in the brain so again the plaque that forms within these vessels walls is the same plaque associated with alzheimer's disease but cerebral amyloid angiopathy is not the same disease and this is a lobar hemorrhage a superficial hemorrhage in a patient with cerebral amyloid angiopathy now if you have cerebral amyloid angiopathy it doesn't mean you have alzheimer's if you have alzheimer's disease it doesn't mean you have cerebral amyloid angiopathy these diseases could coexist but they don't have to exist together so the same plaque formed in beta amyloid plaque that characterizes which is a hallmark one of the hallmarks of alzheimer's disease is the same plaque that we see in cerebral amyloid angiopathy this is immunofluorescent stain showing this plaque integrated within the vessel wall now what's very uh, interesting about this is this is uh, the same immunofluorescent stain staining this plaque the same the plaque is the same but this is not the same disease alzheimer's disease is not the same disease as cerebral amyloid angiopathy incidentally the title slide for this lecture is an immunofluorescent stain of cerebral amyloid angiopathy you can see that the plaque is well integrated within this vessel wall so since cerebral and amyloid angiopathy is more prone to develop in the el elderly cerebral amyloid angiopathy should be considered in elderly patients with superficial lobar hemorrhages cerebral amyloid angiopathy can also cause microbleeds superficially located in intracerebral blood vessels so here's a gradient echo that shows these dark areas of the cerebral microbleeds okay in a patient with cerebral amyloid angiopathy it also shows a large area of lower hemorrhage with high signal surrounding edema okay so again superficial location for all of these entities elderly patients think cerebral amyloid angiopathy thus both cerebral amyloid angiopathy really related microbleeds and lower hemorrhages involve a superficial location because they involve superficially located meningeal and cortical blood vessels microbleeds appear as dark signal on gradient echo, echo mri images that's what these little dark dots are here these microbleeds the larger dark region signal region of signal is that lobar hemorrhage now why is that why does this appear this way well your blood contains iron and when that iron deposits in the brain it causes a metallic susceptibility artifact that's why this appears dark on what we call um, mri images that are susceptible to this okay so we're looking for these dark regions that basically at one point had small bleeds that bleed is resolved and the remaining iron deposition is what gives that 
that dark, dark signal. So again, with cerebral amyloid angiopathy, we're looking at the superficial distribution of microbleeds and superficial distribution of lobar hemorrhage. Now we're gonna switch and focus on hypertensive hemorrhage. Hypertemperature hemorrhage is caused by long-standing hypertension affecting small penetrating arteries in the brain. So this is what we get here. We have these vessels that have been exposed to long-standing hypertension. You could get these small little aneurysms, which are called charcot bouchard microaneurysms. I'm sorry if I butchered that presentation. I'm not French. You get atherosclerosis, arteriosclerosis, which is uh, hardening of small blood vessels in the brain, and fibrinohyalinosis, which again can cause these vessels to rupture and bleed. When they have these small bleeds, we have cerebral microbleeds. When they're larger, we have larger regions of hemorrhage. In contradistinction to cerebral amyloid angiopathy, which affects superficial locations in the brain, hypertension uh, angiopathy is characterized by cerebral microbleeds that are located within deeper structures in the brain, uh, such as the basal ganglia. They can also occur in the pons and the cerebellum. So again, here we have an image of a patient with hypertensive hemorrhage. This is a basal ganglia infar or sorry, a basal ganglia ganglia bleed. This is a classic location for hypertensive bleeds. Again, deeper location within the brain. So just like the hypertensive hemorrhage patients who have uh, microbleeds, these are also found in deeper locations as opposed to cerebral amyloid angiopathy, where these are found in more superficial locations. So when you see um, cerebral microbleeds in a deeper, more centralized location, um, here we see them in the thalamus bilaterally. Here we see this in this bleed in the left thalamus, epicenter in the left thalamus. Think of hypertensive hemorrhage. Now, hemorrhagic stroke caused by hypertension in order of frequency occurs in the basal ganglia 80% of the time, in the pons 10% of the time, and the cerebellum 10% of the time. So really, you're going to see it more often than not in the basal ganglia. In contradistinction to cerebral amyloid angiopathy, hypertensive hemorrhage involves more deeper regions of the brain rather than superficial regions as we see in cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Again, the most common locations of hypertensive hemorrhage are the putamen, the thalamus, the subcortical white matter, the pons, and the cerebellum. So when we're talking about hemorrhagic stroke, we've just reviewed the intracerebral component. Remember we said the intracerebral component counts for 10% of all the stroke. The subarachnoid components, which we're going to talk about next, accounts for 3% of all hemorrhagic of all stroke. The intracerebral component or forms of, of hemorrhage can be characterized or distinguished by their location. When we see a superficially located cerebral microbleeds or hemorrhage, we think of cerebral amyloid angiopathy. When the cerebral microbleeds and hemorrhage are located more deeper locations in the brain, the pons or the cerebellum, we think of hypertensive hemorrhage. So now that we've reviewed intracerebral hemorrhage, let's talk about the other major component of um, hemorrhagic stroke, which is subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, subarachnoid hemorrhage um, can occur with aneurysms. We're going to go over that in more detail. But really, subarachnoid hemorrhage is any hemorrhage that occurs in the subarachnoid space. The most common cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage is trauma. Now, we're not going to talk about trauma today because we're really focused more on stroke. But I will give a talk in the future on brain trauma. So this discussion we're talking about today pertains to non-traumatic causes of subarachnoid hemorrhage, including intracranial ruptured aneurysms, mycotic aneurysms, non-aneurysmal causes of subarachnoid hemorrhage like paramesencephalic venous subarachnoid hemorrhage, and vasculitis. I know that's a mouthful, but it'll make more sense in just a few moments. So we discussed this, I think in chapter three maybe, the different layers in the brain. Remember the outer tougher layer was called the dura matter, the arachnoid matter was in the middle, and the P was that adherent layer that was adherent to the um, subarachnoid hemorrhage, okay, occurs in the subarachnoid space or between the arachnoid matter layer and the pia matter layer. 
that's where it occurs. And we're going to talk about that in greater detail in just one moment. So just like hypertensive hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage can also be divided into deep and superficial locations. The subarachnoid space is located again between the rachnoid matter, the middle meningeal layer, and the pia mater, the, most, the innermost meningeal layer. The subarachnoid space houses extraaxial arteries and veins. Remember we talked about that term extraaxial, I think in lecture three. And again, that means these arteries and veins are not contained within the brain, unlike hypertensive hemorrhage and cerebral amyloid angiopathy. These actually cover the brain. So subarachnoid hemorrhage, bleeding within the subarachnoid space, covers the brain. Therefore, hemorrhage from things located in the subarachnoid space, such as ruptured aneurysms, paramesencephalic veins, vasculitis, mycotic aneurysms, and venous infarct would be located within the subarachnoid space outside of covering the brain, not within the brain, not intracerebral hemorrhage. And here's a picture that shows the arachnoid membrane, the pia mater, and these web-like projections traversing the subarachnoid space. If you ever want to see a diagram of the subarachnoid spaces, just look for these web-like projections that traverse it. And look at this. Blood vessels lie in the subarachnoid space. These can form aneurysms and rupture. And that's why aneurysmal uh, ruptures uh, within the subarachnoid space cause what we call subarachnoid hemorrhage, because the hemorrhage is located in the subarachnoid space. Similarly, we have multiple veins surrounding uh, central regions of the brain outside of the brain in that subarachnoid space, the space between the arachnoid and the pia. And when these veins bleed, they can also have subarachnoid hemorrhage. We'll show examples of that too. So these veins uh, are most commonly found wrapped around the brain stem. They're called the paramesencephalic veins. And we will show you images of that in a second. So whether we're talking about an artery that can develop an aneurysm that ruptures, or the artery ruptures from vasculitis, or it forms a mycotic aneurysm, or talk about veins that are, are located in the subarachnoid space, both of these bleeding can cause subarachnoid hemorrhage because they lie within the subarachnoid space, they bleed within the subarachnoid space. So I apologize if this is too graphic, but we talked about this earlier. The circle of Willis is a ring-like collateral structure in the brain that is important because one, it provides collaterals, but two, it's a frequent site of aneurysms because of all of these arterial bifurcations. This is a patient that didn't make it, and you could see that this bleed that occurred, the subarachnoid hemorrhage from a ruptured aneurysm, is really centered around the same area, the circle of Willis. And notice this bleed is not in the brain, it's covering the surface of the brain. This is the bottom surface of the brain, but again, it's covering the brain, this bleed. Same thing with paramesencephalic bleeds. Now this is from a ruptured aneurysm. This patient obviously didn't make it, but this image just shows that here's the midbrain, here's the midbrain, paramesencephalic veins are around the midbrain. When these bleed, again, they are located within the subarachnoid space that could cause subarachnoid hemorrhage. So when we're talking about subarachnoid hemorrhage, just like intracerebral hemorrhage, we could differentiate between a deep location and a superficial location. Now, when we see deep location subarachnoid hemorrhage, we think of ruptured aneurysms and paramesencephalic venous subarachnoid hemorrhage, okay? When we think of superficial locations, we think of venous infarcts, vasculitis, and mycotic aneurysms. We're gonna go into some examples of that, but just for now, know that subarachnoid hemorrhage, just like intracerebral hemorrhage, can be divided into a central or deep location and superficial locations. So the subarachnoid space houses these intraaxial arteries and veins. Therefore, if these hemorrhage or veins hemorrhage, we can get bleeding within the subarachnoid space, which we call subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, again, subarachnoid hemorrhage can be divided into central and superficial distributions depending on the etiology. Now, a brain aneurysm is a focal bulging or outpouching of a weakened vessel wall. So here's a normal vessel and here's a brain aneurysm. Again, most brain aneurysms are located within or adjacent to the circle of Willis. And again, these vessels are not within the brain. They're housed within the subarachnoid space between that arachnoid membrane and pia. 
Because of their central location, ruptured brain injuries typically have a central distribution of subarachnoid hemorrhage. And here we could see all of this blood in this thing here called the supracellular, which means star-like cistern, which is centrally located. All of this subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is not technically in the brain, this is covering the brain, is centrally located. So again, why is that? Because most aneurysms occur around or adjacent to the circle of Willis. This bleeding is in the subarachnoid membrane, or sorry, in the subarachnoid space. And aneurysms and paramedicine hemorrhage, which we're going to talk about in a second, have this central distribution of bleeding. So just like arteries, these paramedicine veins are located within the subarachnoid space. Remember, here's the arachnoid. It has these web-like projections projecting onto the pia. So paramedicine uh, venous subarachnoid hemorrhage is typically caused by ruptured veins within the posterior fossa. It has a central distribution, just like aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, so it's often confused with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. Because paramedicine venous subarachnoid hemorrhage tends to involve the posterior fossa or the back of the brain, it can, can, can be confused with aneurysms that occur there, such as basilar tip aneurysms. So here's a paramedicine bleed. What's very interesting is, unlike this aneurysmal bleed, which is everywhere, this subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, that we see from this paramesencephalic bleed seems to be more confined. It's centrally located, but it's not as diffuse. And that's one clue that tells us this is a venous bleed and not an aneurysmal bleed. So again, these paramesencephalic veins are in the back of the brain. And what lies in front of this, the midbrain or the uh, brainstem is the basal artery. And a basal tip aneurysm can be confused with the paramesencephalic bleed. But there are some clues. There's three very important neuroimaging clues that, clues that allow us to distinguish paramesencephalic venous subarachnoid hemorrhage from aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. First of all, paramesencephalic veins are located adjacent to and contained with the prepontine and ambient cisterns. So subarachnoid hemorrhage, and prepontine just means in front of the pons, that are located within the prepontine and ambient cisterns raises the diagnosis of venous paramesencephalic subarachnoid hemorrhage. And when we look at these images here, we could, just for some anatomy, this is the fourth ventricle, this is the pons, right in front of the pons is the prepontine cistern. This star-like cistern is called the supercellular cistern. This is the level of the pons, one level above that, the level of the midbrain. We could see that we have the right ambient cistern and Right behind the midbrain, behind the quadrigeminal plate, is the quadrigeminal cistern. So, again, if we see hemorrhage within the prepontine and ambient cisterns, we're favoring paramesencephalic venous subarachnoid hemorrhage. Another clue is veins have less pressure than, arter than arteries. So, if this is a venous hemorrhage, the distribution of this bleeding is not as diffuse as an aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. And for this reason, this bleed pattern tends to be lateralized, meaning it's on one side of the pons or the midbrain. If this was higher pressure, it would exert, go to the other side or even anteriorly, but that doesn't happen with venous subarachnoid hemorrhage. Veins have less pressure than arteries, so they have less pressure and their distribution is usually unilaterally wrapping around the midbrain or pons located within the prepontine cistern or ambient cistern. Now, paramesencephalic venous subarachnoid hemorrhage, that's a lot to say. So I want you to just think of this as venous subarachnoid hemorrhage versus aneurysmal or arterial subarachnoid hemorrhage, okay? Venous hemor subarachnoid hemorrhage, much less pressure, tends to be more localized. Aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage is much more pressure, more diffuse when compared to uh, venous subarachnoid hemorrhage. So again, arteries have more pressure than veins, and that's why we see that. Um, again, when we have arterial pressure from an aneurysm, this is going to distribute to a greater location than lower uh, venous pressure. Remember, subarachnoid hemorrhage covers the brain. It's not within the brain. It covers the brain. So aneurysmal arterial subarachnoid hemorrhage will be more diffuse than lower pressure venous hemorrhage, okay? So again, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, you can see here that it's much more diffuse, whereas venous lower pressure subarachnoid hemorrhage is usually lateralized within the prepontine ambient cisterns at the level of the pons or midbrain.
The final thing to remember about paramesencephalic venous hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage, is it rarely extends anteriorly in the brain. Why is that? Because it has lower pressure. So unlike higher arterial pressure associated with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, this lower pressure venous hemorrhage tends to be localized unilaterally within the prepontine and ambient cistern, usually at the pons or midbrain, and it doesn't extend anteriorly into the ciliary fissures like higher pressure aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage does. So when we're looking at this, <clears throat> the subarachnoid hemorrhages from aneurysms, and here you could clearly see the aneurysm. Again, these are higher pressure subarachnoid bleeds. They're more diffuse, they involve the sylvian fissures, and look at it, both sides of the pons in this situation, okay? So like aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, paramedicencephalic uh, venous subarachnoid hemorrhage is identified in a central location, okay? When we see this distribution of centrally distrib distributed subarachnoid hemorrhage, whether we think it's venous or aneurysmal, we always want to do further imaging studies such as a cerebral angiogram or a CT angiogram to make sure we can confirm the diagnosis of venous versus aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, venous or paramedicencephalic venous subarachnoid hemorrhage has a far greater prognosis than aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. In fact, venous uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, if it's paramesencephalic venous subarachnoid hemorrhage, is one of the, nobody wants to have a bleed in the brain, but if you're going to have a bleed in the brain, that's probably the one you'd want to have. So a CT angiogram looks at all these vessels, and recall we recently reviewed all of this anatomy in chapter four. We're going to review a little bit at the end of this lecture because I got some comments where people want me to go over it in more detail. And I will have a Patreon channel in the, the near future where I'm going to do deep dive lectures into neuroanatomy uh, specific cases in stroke and specific integration of these lectures. So another cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage and specifically superficial subarachnoid hemorrhage, as we said earlier, is vasculitis or inflammation of brain arteries, okay? These can be associated with viral or bacterial infections or autoimmune diseases such as systemic lupus erythematosus. So things like lupus where we have immune cells, your own immune cells attacking these vessels can weaken them and cause them to bleed. In vasculitis, these tend to be more superficially located. One thing about vasculitis that distinguishes it from atherosclerosis is it typically has this sausage-linked pattern where you see like a dilated artery. It looks has this beaded sausage-shaped pattern. It narrows down, that becomes beaded. It has more of a fusiform sausage link pattern compared to discrete atherosclerotic disease, what has like that, that so-called rat bite lesion. So when you see this more smoother fusiform regions of dilatation and narrowing, think of vasculitis versus atherosclerotic disease. And the more you look at this, you see these areas of dilatation, narrowing, dilatation, narrowing, dilatation, narrowing, dilatation, narrowing, dilatation. This is the hallmark for vasculitis. Now you don't have to see it on angiography for you, sorry, you could have vasculitis and it may not be angiographically evident. Because this involves, vasculitis involves superficially located blood vessels, these bleeds are superficially located. So these subarachnoid hemorrhages are superficial. And here you could see a sulci. Remember we talked about the difference between sulci and gyri. And now you can see why I went through all that anatomy, so you got to understand this better. Here is a bleed in this sulcus. And by the way, this is the pre-central sulcus. How do I know that? Because this is the central sulcus. This is the hand knob. Another form of superficial subarachnoid hemorrhage is mycotic aneurysms or microbial arteritis. Those two terms are frequently interchanged. And this is an aneurysm that, unlike brain aneurysms that we covered earlier that are centrally located around the super circle of Willis, these are more superficially distributed, okay? And these are related to infections that involve blood vessels in the brain. So again, when we look at these mycotic aneurysms, these are complications of hematogenous spreads of bacterial infection that affects more distal superficially located blood vessels in the brain. Now, these aneurysms, like other brain aneurysms, are saccular, okay? But again, when we talked about the brain 
our classic brain aneurysms, they typically are formed around the circle of Willis. Why is that? Because there's more hemodynamic stress at arterial bifurcations. Whereas mycotic aneurysms tend to involve more smaller, superficially located blood vessels. And again, that's because when we look at typical brain aneurysms around the circle of Willis, they occur at arterial bifurcations because of hemodynamic stress. However, mycotic aneurysms, on the other hand, are caused by infections in arterial walls. We'll go over that in a minute. And this infection weakens the arterial wall. It's not the hemodynamic stress that we see in regular angels around the circle of Willis that causes the angels to grow. It's the infection that weakens the arterial wall. And for that reason, these mycotic aneurysms tend to involve more superficial arteries, more distal superficial arteries, and not centrally located arteries around the circle of Willis. And here's why. This is a diagram that shows a septic embolus. Maybe it came from the heart or from the bloodstream. And it is engaged in the vessel wall. It weakens the vessel wall, and over time, this weakened vessel wall turns into a mycotic aneurysm. Again, unlike typical brain aneurysms, this occurs in more superficially distal located blood vessels. So when they have bleeding, okay, because they're superficial location, you could see this mycotic aneurysm in a super ves superficial vessel, cortical vessel here. You could see this little round area, that's the mycotic aneurysm. There's a small area of parenchymal subarachnoid hemorrhage, but this is superficially located, okay? Here's another example of just a pure superficial subarachnoid hemorrhage due to an underlying aneurysm. Here's the MRI, here's the CT. Again, small superficial subarachnoid hemorrhage within a sulcal space of the brain. Another entity that present with superficial subarachnoid hemorrhage pattern is a venous infarct. Now we're gonna talk about venous infarcts and um, venous uh, occlusions in the brain in a subsequent le lecture. But just for now, just know it's on the differential for superficially located subarachnoid hemorrhage. One last concept I want to talk about before we end is something called the intracerebral hemorrhagic, sorry, the intracerebral hemorrhage score or the ICH score. This is a score that is required by all comprehensive stroke centers to have all their uh, patients evaluated by this. This involves evaluation of the Glasgow Chemo Scale. Uh, intracranial hemorrhage volume, the presence of intraventricular hemorrhage or not, age, and the infratentorial location of the bleed. And that's another reason we made that, we went over that lecture of infratentorial versus supratentorial. You'll see that all the information I gave in that prior lecture will be utilized in subsequent lectures. So in summary, every acute ischemic stroke patient receives a non-contrast brain CT. So in about 10% of those CTs, you're gonna see intracranial hemorrhage. You now have a good differential diagnosis of what causes that hemorrhage. And if you're working a stroke center, believe me, you're gonna see intracranial hemorrhage and it's good to have this information. So remember, this intracranial hemorrhage, we divided into bleeding within the brain parenchyma, intracerebral hemorrhage, or on its surface, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Intracranial hemorrhage within the skull is not the same as intracerebral hemorrhage, hemorrhage within the brain parenchyma. When we see a superficial distribution of intracerebral hemorrhage, we think of cerebral amyloid angiopathy, whereas a more central or deep distribution indicates hypertensive hemorrhage. Subarachnoid hemorrhage can also present with a central or superficial distribution. Typically, ruptured intracranial aneurysms and paramesencephalic venous subarachnoid hemorrhage, so aneurysmal and venous subarachnoid hemorrhage, tend to occur in more central locations within the brain, resulting in a central distribution of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Entities involving more superficial arteries in the subarachnoid space include vasculitis, mycotic aneurysms, and venous infarcts. So these three entities, vasculitis, mycotic aneurysms, and venous infarcts, tend to have more superficial subarachnoid hemorrhage patterns. The ability to discern parenchymal and subarachnoid hemorrhage based on superficial or central distributions will greatly aid in determining the etiology of intracranial hemorrhage. So in summary, we talked about hemorrhagic stroke today. This is the overwhelming minority of stroke and accounts for 13% of all stroke. 
10% of all the stroke is intracerebral, 3% of all the stroke is subarachnoid hemorrhage. When you see an intracerebral bleed, bleeding within the parenchyma of the brain, you have to decide, is this a superficial or deep location? If it's a superficial location in an elderly person, patient, think of cerebral amyloid angiopathy. If this is in a deep location, think of hypertensive hemorrhage. Similarly, if you see subarachnoid hemorrhage, you have to ask yourself, is this in a deep location or a superficial location? If it's deep, think of aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage or paramesencephalic venous subarachnoid hemorrhage. Remember, this form of venous subarachnoid hemorrhage has certain diagnostic clues. Remember, veins have less pressure than aneurysm. So on a CT scan, these bleeds tend to be laterally oriented around the, the pons or the midbrain within the prepontine and ambient cistern, okay? Because they don't have a lot of pressure, they're not diffusely distributed, and they don't extend up into the sylvian fissures anteriorly like aneurys aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhages. If subarachnoid hemorrhage is found in a superficial location, we're thinking about entities that involve more superficial, more distal vessels such as venous infarct, vasculitis, and mycotic aneurysms. Now, this venous infarct doesn't involve an artery superficially located or distally located, it involves veins. But vasculitis and mycotic aneurysms are also uh, structures, uh, also involve structures located in more superficially located regions of the subarachnoid space. Now, I know that was a lot of information, but I want to go through anatomy again very quickly. So we're going to talk about the posterior circulation. Both vertebral arteries here form the basal artery. Before they do, they give off the posterior inferior cerebral artery. Remember, the basal artery has all these pontine perforators. The next major vessel off the basal artery is the superior cerebellar artery. The basal artery terminates into two posterior cerebral arteries. These communicate with the anterior circulation via the posterior communicating arteries. So here, this is labeled. We have both vertebral arteries form the basal artery. Before they do, they go off the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. After the basal artery is formed, the first major vessel is the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, followed by the superior cerebellar artery, located between these two are pontine perforators. The basal artery terminates into two posterior cerebral arteries. It communicates with the anterior circulation via these posterior communicating arteries. Remember we talked about the four components of the internal carotid artery? Remember, the ophthalmic artery and above separates the supraclient segment above and the cavernous segment below. The ophthalmic artery and everything above it is considered intradural, it's contained within the brain. Everything below the ophthalm ophthalmic artery is extradural. Now, I went to a lot of detail on this when I um, did the chapter four lecture. I suggest you review it if you have any questions. I'm also going to do a deep dive into both posterior and anterior circulation anatomy on the Patreon channel, which is not up yet, but it should be up, should be up soon. Um, remember, we talked about all four of those segments of the internal carotid artery. They terminate, or the carotid artery itself terminates at a carotid terminus. Then the carotid artery <clears throat> bifurcates laterally into a middle cerebral artery and medially into an anterior cerebral artery. The anterior cerebral artery has uh, an A1 segment, its first segment, connected to the opposite side via the anterior communicating artery, and distal to the anterior communicating artery is the A2 segment. The middle cerebral artery, again, uh, is oriented laterally. The vessels coming off the first segment or M1 segment are called lateral lenticular straight arteries. These are the arteries involved with most of hypertensive hemorrhage. Again, 80% occurs in the basal ganglia, and that's exactly what these arteries supply. Here's the bifurcation of the superior and inferior division of the middle cerebral artery. As it ascends up around the insular cortex, these are M2 or insular branches. As it descends down around the frontal operculum, these are M3 or opercular branches. And as it extends over the cortex, these are cortical or M4 branches. Here's an angiogram showing the carotid terminus. Here's the A1 segment, A2 segment. Here's the M1 segment, superior and inferior division. As these vessels ascend up, these are M2 segments as they descend down. They're M3 segments. As they go out to the cortex, these are M4 segments. Well, I think that covers just about everything we're going to talk about today. I hope you enjoyed the content of this video. Remember, all of this stuff is in the book. So if you just read the book, you'll understand all of this. If you found that this lecture provided value, please hit the like and subscribe button. Thank you very much for listening.